So again, welcome everyone to Zoom Masterclass uh, manage and facilitate like a pro. Um, this is a workshop hosted by ETS. Um, I am Gabrielle Coombs. I am a learning designer um, with ETS, and I am joined today by two of my colleagues, uh, Eduardo and Marika. So, Eduardo, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes. Hi, everyone. I'm Eduardo, and I'm the learning technology specialist at ETS. Thank you, everyone, for coming, and I'm looking forward to doing this workshop. And we also have uh, Mary Kitching with us, who is our new educational technologist, uh, who will be facilitating the chat today. Uh, Marika, if you would like to say hello. Hi, everyone. So I'm Marika, and nice to meet you all. So uh, this is actually my first week here. So yeah, hope to see you in, in later time as well. Thank you. Fantastic. Um, of course, we would like to acknowledge that UBC Vancouver is situated on the traditional unceded territory of the Musqueam, Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh Nations. Um, we would really like to extend the invitation to everyone here to also um, add a land acknowledgement in the chat if you can. Um, and if you're interested in learning more about the First Nation um, or Indigenous territories where you're living, I um, really recommend going to Native dashland.ca, uh, which is a great online resource. Okay, so we'll go through the agenda of what we're looking at today. Um, we're going to go through what you can do before you have your Zoom meeting. So looking at your account settings and any sort of pre-made preparation that you can do. We're also going to look at what happens during the meeting. So, you know, a lot of the time, as much as you plan, things go wrong, things happen. So what you can do during the meeting to be organized. Um, and then also some best practices for after the meeting as well. We'll um, hopefully have a bit of time at the end to get some feedback, um, have people ask questions if you have any specific Zoom questions. Um, however, our next meeting, um, which is in a couple of weeks time uh, for the next session on Zoom, um, we will be looking at some commonly asked uh, or frequently asked questions, some really complicated ones um, that, that can be quite useful to know about um, in our next session, but any other questions that you might have, obviously you're welcome to ask. Now, so I'm going to uh, pass it over to Eduardo, who is going to get started at looking at pre-meeting preparation. Thank you, Gabby. I'm going to share my screen now. Okay, so here we're going to provide a couple of tips and um, look at some of the features that we have um, in the global uh, account settings, so you so we can prepare before a meeting. So I'm gonna go to, oh, oh, first of all, I should mention that, let me see, that when we're preparing for a meeting in Zoom, we can do it in two ways. So we can do it through the desktop app, or we can do it through the web browser app. Now, the first one, the desktop app is okay, like it has a couple of features, but the web browser is much more comprehensive. So we, suggest using this option and we're going to be looking at this one so i'm going to go to um uh, zoom on the web so that will be uh, zoom.us and you will log, log in and be in your account as you can see here i mean in, um, in the ets account so if we go to the settings we can start tricking things in the global account settings and this will this means that whatever we um, pick here, whatever settings we define here would apply to all of the meetings we'll be creating from this account. Now, here in the settings, we have lots of options, like many, many controls. So just uh, I'll show you, just like scrolling down, you see like we have tons of them. So actually going over all of them will require a lot of time. So we're just going to go over the most important ones and the things, uh, the ones we consider um, that are mo most useful in this case. So first of all, um, let me go here's the settings. And we have security. So one of the most important things here is um, enabling the waiting room if you want to have that. So for example, if you're creating a meeting and um, like today, like we're having this meeting and 15 minutes earlier, uh, Gabby and I and Marika, we met and we were like discussing a couple of things before the meeting. And of course, we don't want people joining us beforehand. So if you want people to be in a, in a waiting room, 
you will choose this option. So but take uh, into consideration that this will be for all the meetings. So if you always want to have a waiting room, you will choose this one. Now, if you um, if you don't want to choose that, and maybe like later, every time you create a meeting, you want to select this option depending on the meeting, you can, all, you can also do that. So you might want to leave this up, and every time you create a meeting, every time you schedule a meeting, you can choose this option for that specific meeting. And we're going to show you how to do that as well. So in this case, I'm going to leave it off, but um, you can set a couple of uh, options for the waiting room, as we've done here. So in this second place, where we have the uh, waiting room options, we can go into edit and choose a couple of things. So for example, I could select that everyone who joins the meeting will go into a, a waiting room. But you could also choose like users that are not in the account and some other things. And um, here you can choose them to join um, just by order as they come or alphabetically. So I would suggest just leaving it as it is in this case. And that's good. So um, let's continue. Then if we move to the, uh, oh, let me see here. Yeah, this. Okay, so we have a couple of things here in the settings. We have security, a schedule meeting, and some other. Some other. So I'm going to show you a couple of them. Let's move to schedule meeting. And in schedule meeting, we can um, define a couple of things, such as um, um, video. For example, as soon as the meeting begins, uh, we have people enabled with videos. So that's one thing you can pick. Uh, by default, this opt, and we was, we would suggest also leaving it leaving it like that. And the same thing for participants. Um, if you scroll down a little bit, we'll see the options for enabling a personal meeting ID. So um, in Zoom, as I would imagine most of you know, we have a, a personal meeting uh, room, which means that each account has like a, a room that anyone can join if you share that link with, the, with another person. So that's kind of like your Zoom room. And um, this is something that we obviously want. Sometimes we want to you know, you're just like talking to someone and you want to quickly meet and you send them the link and they can just join you. But um, there's there could be a couple of security issues with this. For example, if you are using that for all your meetings, meaning you're giving that link to everyone you're, you meet, then eventually someone could join that meeting later on and perhaps you are with someone else in that meeting. So ideally, uh, we would suggest to be careful with this uh, personal Zoom room. Just use it like in specific cases, and it would be better if you always schedule uh, meetings for specific events and meetings. Then if we go to um, basic, here we uh, you can um, change a couple of things related to the chat. So as you know, as you've seen, in Zoom we have the chat and you can communicate with everyone or you can send private messages. And usually you have all these features enabled by default. But if for some reason you wanted to add some limitations, like people cannot send messages or they can only send messages to the hosts or different things, you can set that up here. So you can go here and select um, different options, like, like no messages, for example, or just for hosts and for hosts, everyone or everyone and anyone, meaning like also private messages. So there you can do a couple of things with the chat. And then uh, let's keep scrolling down. Yeah, also if you want to enable meeting pools and quizzes, you can do that here and add in co-hosts. So really like, as you can see, most of the, these uh, things, they come in a way which are optimal. So you might not want to change them. Um, but it's good to know that you can for some specific events that you might be doing. Then I would suggest, um, as I mentioned, this is like a very extensive uh, set of uh, controls, but um, I would suggest when you have time, you can go over and explore them because they all contain uh, very well-explained uh, blurbs so you know what you can do. So that will be a couple of, those are a couple of things for the global account settings. Now, um, perhaps, most important is to go to the recording settings.
So when we record something in Zoom, as we're doing today, recording this meeting, you have two options. You can record it on your computer, that will be the local recording, or you can record it in the cloud, which means um, in, the, in, Zoom, in the Zoom service. So basically, um, there are a couple of differences. So the first one um, means that when you record on your computer, you get a couple of files. You get the video, and you get the uh, chat file, and you also get the audio. And that's pretty much it. But uh, when you use cloud recording, you have, you have more options. And one of the benefits as well is that that will give you a link that then you can share with other people. So for example, if you were doing a Zoom recording and then you want to give the people who attended the, the meeting the recording so they can review it or anything like that, you can just send that link. So it's more accessible in that sense. And you can, and you also have more options from where to pick. So for example, you could choose to record um, the active speaker in, in the shared screen, kind of like right now, so I, am, I am the active speaker and I'm also sharing, but we can also have the gallery view with shared screen, which means like everyone who's currently um, in the gallery, like Gabby and Marika and so forth. Or we can also choose that to record the active speaker, the gallery view and the shared screen separately, which means that you will get like more files and then maybe you can, <clears throat> choose which one you, you would like to share. Then you also have some options for recording audio, of course, um, just recording the audio file. So you just have the audio file and this is more advanced, but for some reason you could also choose to have the um, separate audio files. Like if we have like five people speaking, have that separately in five different tracks. So this could be interesting if it would be in a more complex project, but I think it could be useful, for example, if then somebody's going to mix the audio and they want to change the levels of each person and want to have more control over the audio. So those are the uh, record settings. Then if we move to, let, let's look at scheduling. So how do we schedule an event in Zoom? Like I mentioned, we can do that like in the app, but in the in the browser, we have more options. So to do that, we will go to meetings. And here in meetings, we can schedule a meeting. Of course, I, I see all the upcoming meetings and we can see the previous meetings and, and such. But to create one, we will select this option, schedule meeting. And here, you'll give it a topic, just choose the date, the duration, time zone. Um, passcode, and perhaps what's important here, I think this is very obvious, so you probably all know this, but um, here, if you go to options, you have a couple of, you have uh, more things. So for example, if you want to have alternative hosts, perhaps you're co-hosting the meeting, and um, and you want that person, the other host, to have all the right, all the permissions as soon as they get into the meeting, you can uh, invite them beforehand. So in that case, you will just go here and put the email address. Then um, you can also do a couple of things. For example, allow, allow participants to join anytime. You can choose that option and mute participants upon entry, um, automatically record a meeting and some other options. So that's, that will be how you schedule a meeting. But for example, then what if you want to um, use a pool? That's something that is usually used in Zoom meetings. And how, how can you make that beforehand and not you know, in the actual meeting? So if you want to do that, it won't be here in the scheduling meeting window, but it will be um, after creating the event. So for example, let's say that I created that event and let's say it's this one, the this one here, these consultations. Um, I will go to the event, just click on that. And then if you scroll down, you'll find the pool increases section. So here you can easily create a pool. Uh, maybe this will be pool one. And then you can have a question. You have two options. It can be single choice or it can be multiple choice. And this is not just for, um, let's say, learning objectives or purposes, you know, like asking something to students, but it can be also used, for example, when you're beginning a meeting on a specific topic, and you can ask people to respond to how confident 
they feel on a specific topic, and that way you can get feedback on how to conduct your meeting. So it is simple, very simple interface. You can just add more choices and, and change it, change them accordingly. And I think that's pretty much it for the for the setup. Yeah. So now we can continue with Gabby. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. So I'm just going to share my screen and let's talk about um, just sort of following up from what Eduardo had said um, about polls. One nice thing that you can do with the polling um, function on uh, on Zoom is to uh, save your polls so that you can use them in multiple um, situations. So if you uh, maybe have a few classes or if you're going to host the same workshop a couple of times, uh, you can save that poll and then attach it to future meetings. So that's a nice function that Zoom has that it didn't use to before. Okay, so I'm going to share my screen again and we're going to have a look at um, accessibility. So captions is something that is available on Zoom. And I would really highly recommend people uh, considering this uh, as something that is part of best practice. Um, one thing that you may notice is that it may, might not be available for you immediately. So you might need to go into your settings to enable them. Um, so Zoom does have a few different captioning options. So you, Zoom has its own inbuilt captions, which are visible to everyone. So if I enable closed captions, it means that anyone who is in the meeting when they're speaking, uh, they will have captions available. Uh, in a moment, when I go into the sort of nitty gritty controls of Zoom, um, I'll show you how to enable that. Um, there are other options as well. Um, if, for example, um, you want to have one of uh, somebody who is present in the meeting um, transcribe it, you can definitely have somebody live captioning. Um, we also have an option for um, at UBC for um, captions which are of a slight, like a better quality um, than the auto captions on Zoom. However, these um, auto captioning, this API token, again, I will show you guys how to do this in a moment, but this particular um, API token is only for you. Um, it works off of your microphone. So this would be great if you're doing a presentation or if you're doing a lecture where you're not anticipating having any questions or dialogue in a, in a Zoom meeting, um, this would be great for captioning. However, if it is something a little more interactive, if you have other people in the um, meeting, uh, it would probably make more sense to use Zoom's inbuilt captions. Um, another option is, of course, to get in touch with UBC Centre for Accessibility. If um, you have somebody who, uh, before your meeting um, begins, say that they would prefer to have ASL interpreting, um, or if they would like different captions done um, or translations, then that's something that you can organise through the UBC Centre for Accessibility. Um, so if you do want to enable captions, again, this is going to be in your web browser settings here, and I will zoom in a little so it's a little bigger, maybe not all the, all the way. Um, so if you are here, you're going to go to advanced. And if you scroll down a little, you should have the option for manual captions, so you can enable that. You should also have the option for automated captions, and this is nice, it's in a few different languages. Um, something I would definitely recommend doing if you're planning on recording a lot um, is to enable the full transcript. Um, this means that when you have finished your recording, you get the transcript as well. So that's really useful if you're planning on writing a summary of a, a meeting that you're having, or if you just want to have a written version of your meeting. Uh, you can also allow participants to save captions too. So if you think that would be useful for you know, the people who are going to be in your Zoom session, um, it might be worth enabling that as well. So that's going to be in the in-meeting advanced section and all of the caption options are grouped together. So definitely something to think about. Okay, so once you've set everything up, um, it's worth thinking about how you can facilitate um, while you're in the meeting. So 
Uh, first piece of advice is to enter your Zoom meeting early. Uh, as Eduardo said earlier, we came into this meeting 15 minutes beforehand, and that is just so that we can ensure that the audio and the video are working properly, that our share screen is working as intended, um, and just to test things out um, to make sure that everything is working as planned. Um, I would say that ideally 10 to 15 minutes is best, um, just to give you a bit of time to get set up and prepared. Um, but if you know, time is of the essence, even five minutes before will do. It's just good to make sure that you're in there a little earlier than uh, your participants, just so that you can get everything set up and things will run smoothly. Um, the other thing to do would be to provide any hosting or co-hosting privileges if you haven't done it when you're setting up. So, you know, these things happen. You might have uh, somebody new who's coming in and needs to co-host or at least have some kind of hosting capability so that they can, um, you know, fac help facilitate um, or administer the session. Um, so definitely think about that. Um, screen sharing access where necessary. Uh, you can do this by providing people with co-hosting um, capacity or there are other ways that you can allow sharing and I'll show you how to do that in a moment. Um, ideally as well, and I would say that this particular piece of advice is really good if you have a very, very large group, um, that it might be worth having someone dedicated to the waiting room. If you have, say, for example, like 100 participants coming in and it's, you know, a Zoom link that has been widely disseminated and you're worried about maybe people coming in who shouldn't be there, um, or if it's a class and you want to make sure that only your students are coming in, um, having a waiting room is great and having someone dedicated to that waiting room um, saves you as the facilitator a lot of uh, grief. So that might be worth looking into for a really large meeting. Um, and the other thing to do as well is to set up those closed captions. Um, so that can be done when you're in your meeting. I'll go through those controls in a moment to show you how to do so. The other things that I would uh, recommend doing is if you're recording your meeting, um, announcing that you're going to do so um, and giving some time to participants um, if they would prefer to not be recorded, um, giving them some time to maybe turn off their video, uh, remove their picture if they have a picture attached um, and rename themselves. Um, the other thing too is that depending on how you're recording, if you're recording to the cloud or if you're recording locally, um, you may need to configure your screen in a particular way and we can look at that in a moment too. Um, if you're having something that's really interactive, I would really recommend giving some very clear expectations of participation to the people who are um, joining your session. So if you want people to be answer, asking questions during the session, let them know. Um, you might want them to ask questions using the raise hand function, or you might want them to ask questions out loud. Uh, you might want them to ask questions in the chat. So just ensuring that if you're, um, if you have some kind of participatory activity in your Zoom session, um, make sure that those expectations are really clear for people because it will, again, from a facilitation perspective, makes your life a lot easier if you don't have people interrupting or your chat is overwhelmed when really like you're trying to focus on presenting material. Um, so that again is a nice piece of advice. And the same thing if you're using breakout rooms. So if you're planning on having breakout rooms where you have um, smaller groups where they may be chatting together, uh, giving really clear instructions to people about what is expected to them, expected of them in the breakout room before they go in, um, before you open the breakout room. I've made that mistake many times where I've said, okay, I'm going to open some breakout rooms and then I'll click open and then everyone goes into their breakout room before I've told them what to do. Um, so making sure that those instructions are clear before you open them. Um, and then where possible, I would really recommend as well adding any questions that you have or instructions into the chat. So for a breakout room, if there is a task, um, a nice thing to do is to say it out loud. If you have a PowerPoint, you know, that's great. But if there's any written instructions that you can put in the chat, um, I would recommend putting that in the global chat first and then opening your breakout room so that um, whoever it is who is in that breakout room will still be able to see those instructions once they've moved from the main room into the breakout room. Okay, so let's go through the nitty gritty. I'm going to sh stop sharing for a moment and then I'm going to share again.
And I'm going to show how to Okay, great. So I'm just going to change my video settings so that I can share my control for you, controls for everyone. Um, and please let me know if you can see my controls. Um, it will probably look a little funny when I do. Okay, can everyone see all of my Zoom controls? Yep. Great. Okay. So for me, it will probably look a little different to your controls, but we'll start from one side and then go through. Um, so you'll see in the bottom left hand corner, we have uh, the audio option, so you can mute or unmute yourself. Um, you can also choose which microphone um, you are using. So for example, if you're using um, a headset and you want to use that microphone, you would decide here. Um, the same with your speaker, depending on what you would prefer. The, with video, you can also stop people's video, stop your video. Um, and edit uh, video settings. As the um, host, you should also have the option to uh, stop or add video for any of the participants. I can ask people to mute themselves or unmute. So if you can see, I'm currently, I'm going to pick on you, Junko, I'm sorry. Um, I have here, I'm going to ask you to unmute, and then I can also ask you to start video. Um, and that's just a request that will pop up on Junko's side um, to request that they turn on their audio and turn on their video. So that again, if you're wanting um, to encourage people to have their video on, that's something you could do. Uh, so let's move into security. So this is where you can, um, in the moment, if for example, you've forgotten to enable the waiting room, um, you can do so here. So if I click this, it means anyone who tries to enter now will be put into a waiting room, um, which is subject to us approving them coming into the meeting. Another thing that you can do is you can lock the meeting, which means that anyone um, trying to get in or um, well, people can leave, <laughs> they can get out, but anyone trying to get in um, won't be able to, the meeting is locked. So that might be useful um, if, uh, for example, you wanted to have a private chat with somebody. Um, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Thanks, Vicky. Um, definitely. So yeah, if, for example, you're having a meeting with, uh, say, like a group of students, and then one student wanted to hang back and ask a couple of questions, you could lock your meeting just to ensure that you have that privacy and you won't have people coming back in. Um, another thing you can do is uh, manage your participants. So if I click participants, I'm going to get everyone here. And again, I can have a lot of options here. I can mute people. So say, for example, um, Eduardo is being incredibly noisy. I can yeah. mute him here. Um, if, for example, um, you know, I think everyone has their own, like it, it maybe not personal experience, but maybe knows of somebody who's accidentally left their video on and um, maybe you've seen something that you weren't supposed to see, you can also turn people's video off. Um, so in this case, I, for America, I'm going to stop your video and that has turned America's video off. So again, as the host, you do have the ability to stop audio and stop video. America, you can turn your video back on again if you'd like, um, just to sort of demonstrate that we have the, this sort of flexibility as part of your facilitation. Um, this is also where you can rename yourself if you'd like. So for me, I can rename here. Another nice thing that you can do with participants, you don't have to do it there, you can also do it by hovering over each individual in your um, screen is to pin and spotlight and often one of the questions that I get is what's the difference between pinning and spotlighting. So pinning is local. So it's only for you. No one else in the meeting is going to see it. So for example, if I'm trying to focus on one person. Um, just on my end, I can pin. So for here with Marika, if I click pin, this means for me, she will appear this way, but for the rest of the participants in the session, it won't appear this way. So I'm going to unpin and it should go back to this gallery view. So pinning is entirely local, that's only for you. 
Spotlighting, however, is where as a host, you can um, focus the attention on one or two people. Um, you can even do three if you're if you're lucky, you just have to have enough people in the meeting. So say, for example, I wanted uh, all the attention to be on me, I would click spotlight for everyone. And then this will force everyone to look at my face. Um, the same thing as well, if maybe I'm co presenting with someone. So in this case, uh, with Eduardo, I can add the spotlight. And then both of us are going to be highlighted. Um, I can remove that spotlight too if I wanted to. And I will do the same for me because I would prefer not to be spotlighted. Um, but yes, you have options. So the difference between them, spotlighting is I want everyone in the meeting to see it. Pinning is I just want to see it. It doesn't matter if anyone else can see it. So that's something that you can do when you're going through participants. Uh, okay, so with the chat as well, um, chat's super useful. We have all of these options here. Um, you can chat with everyone and you can chat with individuals. This is actually a setting that you can change in, in the um, web settings as Eduardo was demonstrating before. Um, if for whatever reason you would prefer to not have people um, talking privately in the chat, um, you can disable that option if you want. Okay, um, you can see also I have quite a few other options at the bottom. So with screen sharing, um, one thing that you can do if you're hosting and you wanted to provide, say, for example, if you're teaching a class, um, you can choose the advanced sharing options. And this will give you the option to see, okay, who can share, just the host or everyone? Um, how many people can share at the same time? Um, can we start sharing at the same time as someone else is sharing? Um, so the advanced sharing options are quite useful. Uh, I think from my experience, a lot of the time when people want to give sharing um, access to people, they'll often just make you a co-host, which absolutely does work. But with that comes the, the person, that person who you've made the co-host, that gives them the ability to really make some big changes um, to the meeting. So if you want to let somebody share their screen, but you don't want them to have any ability to, you know, like mute other people or kick people out of the meeting or whatever it might be, um, I would recommend going into these advanced sharing options where you can allow everyone to share their screen, but they won't get the power to do a bunch of other things in the Zoom meeting at the same time. So I'm going to go back to host only. And that's a good option. On that note, as I was talking about kicking people out, that's something else that you can do um, if you're in participants um, and in, or maybe not, in, it's in security, I think. So I can um, remove people if I would like. Maybe I have a, a troublesome um, participant um, and I can choose to remove someone if I want to. And then that will give me these options here. Um, usually the default setting on Zoom is that if you've removed or kicked someone from your Zoom session, they won't be able to access it again. Um, you can change that setting in the back end, but one would imagine that probably if you're removing someone from a Zoom meeting, you want them gone for good. Um, but yes, something to think about as well as an option. Uh, so you'll see here at the bottom, we also have, um, I have my recording controls and captions. So at the moment I'm using captions. I can hide them, I can show them. So if you're someone who you know, really benefits from having closed captions, Zoom does have inbuilt ones. They're usually pretty good. Um, you know, I've, I've noticed sometimes my, because of my accent and it won't be perfect, but for the most part, I think they're relatively accurate. Um, that being said, if you wanted to use that Zoom API token, what you would do is you can enable that manual captioning and then you would copy that API token and add it to that Zoom um, site. And I'll um, quickly show you how that works now. I think I've shared my entire screen. So let's have a look. It's in here. Oh, no, <laughs> not today. It's not happening. <laughs> not if I have to do a push notification. Okay, so what you would do is you would set up that manual captioning, copy that API token and click on that link, um, which will take you then and you would copy and paste it in there. 
Um, if you're doing breakout rooms, again, you can do that in the moment if you'd like to. You can set them up beforehand, but um, unless you have a full uh, list of emails of people who are going to be in it, you might not be able to choose the exact configurations you want beforehand, but you might want to set up those rooms and then manually add students or whoever is joining the Zoom meeting to those uh, breakout rooms. Um, there are options for, of course, how you configure them so you can assign people to them automatically. Um, I can include or not include co-hosts in those uh, breakout rooms. Um, I can assign them manually, so if I want particular people to be in particular groups, I can do that. Um, I can also let my participants who are in the Zoom meeting choose their own breakout rooms. Um, but one thing is when you have created your breakout room, and in this case, I'm going to let's do it and assign manually and create. Um, I can rename the name of each room. I can assign people. I can also delete rooms if I don't think they're going to be used. Um, I can add rooms here if I want more. Um, I can recreate them. And then if I wanted to, again, make any changes, I can do that here. Um, with a breakout room, when you close it, they have a count, um, the participants have 60 seconds to finish up and leave. You can change that time to give them more or less time. The minute might be too long, if, especially if you have time constraints. Um, so maybe you only want to give them 10 seconds, but the default is 60. So if you do want to change that, you can. Um, you can also automatically close them if you set it up in a way that um, maybe you only want people to be in there for 10 minutes and you want to be really, really structured and not too flexible. You can, again, give them um, a really specific amount of time in that breakout room. Um, again, if you have any instructions before you click open all rooms, put any instructions um, in the chat, because as, um, I, as I said earlier, in my experience, as soon as you click open breakout rooms, everyone's going to be gone um, because they get the pop up, they click enter room and they're zipped away to their breakout room. So if you do have any really crucial information for them to do uh, whatever activity or discussion they're doing in that breakout room, just make sure that they have that information before you open up. Um, Another function that is quite nice is uh, the reactions. So this could be um, a really helpful way of um, encouraging participation. So there's the raise hand function for questions. Um, what happens with raise hand is it puts that person into the top right or top left, sorry, of your screen so you'll see them. Um, and as a participant, you can raise and lower your hand as needed. Um, there are other reactions too. You can always, as Eduardo's done, added an emoji, which is really nice. If you wanted to ask questions, you could, or yes or no questions, you have a yes, you can poll people um, or a no. So again, this is like a nice way of, um, again, getting some engagement, uh, which can be really helpful, especially if you uh, don't have a lot of people with video on. Uh, there are some other functions um, like the different views you can have. So gallery view or speaker view. Speaker view just means that in this case, I have a very uh, big image of Eduardo underneath my gallery at the top. Um, if I want gallery, that just means I'll see everyone. And if I'm sharing my screen, of course, then I will have um, my gallery on the side or my speaker on the side and then my, sh my shared screen here. The whiteboarding function is something that we will probably go um, into in more depth in our next section, um, but this is something that has been changed recently on Zoom. Um, they've started uh, a whiteboarding function, which sort of works in a really similar way to Google Docs in that you can work collaboratively with people in your Zoom meeting on a particular uh, piece of work using the Zoom whiteboard function. And then it saves and you can then edit it after your Zoom meeting. Um, and it's much like Google Docs works. Um, it's all live. You can change things and add things as you go. Um, and again, if you're trying to avoid using um, you know, Google products for privacy reasons or whatever it might be, um, this could be a better alternative for you if you're looking for a sort of in the moment whiteboarding tool or collaboration tool. Okay, so I think that is going through all of the settings, um, the nitty gritty settings <laughs> um, when you're in the meeting. So I'm going to pass it back to Eduardo now who's going to go through post-meeting best practices. Might need to unmute yourself, Eduardo. Okay, good now. 
Yeah. Yeah, you got me. Okay. So yeah, we're gonna be looking now at the uh, post meeting best practices. Really simple stuff. A couple of tips here for you. So if we go back to the um, browser version, let's say that you had a recording of the session, or even if you didn't have a, a recording, but you want to know who attended the session, you want to look at the names or even the emails. How do we access that that uh, data? We go to reports, and here we'll go to usage. And you can look up for meetings within a one, a one month period. So if I go here and just go back one month in the from, I'll see all the some data um, from each meeting. And uh, probably the thing you're most interested in here would be the participants in case you want to see the names again, like to know who attended the meeting, or also if you, if you want to get um, the emails, the email addresses. So uh, let's go to one of them. For example, you see we have many meetings here, and you can see also the number of participants. So for example, in, in this first one, we only have three, and this one two. So let's say I want to go to this one that has 67 participants. You would just click on the number, and you will get the information of all the uh, names of the participants. You can see them here on the left. Now, why do we see some emails, not all the emails? That's because like, when someone joins a Zoom meeting, they can do that through an, an email, an account, as most of us have, have done today. Or some people just uh, join the meeting through the link, just clicking the link and going into the meeting. So in that case, there's no way uh, Zoom can retrieve any email uh, data. So you will see it sometimes, and sometimes you won't see it, but that's the reason why. So that will be the first uh, thing relating to um, getting the information of participant attendance and email addresses. Now let's go to recordings. Let's say that you recorded a session. What can you do? How can you share it? So if you go here to recordings, you'll find your cloud recordings and also the local local recordings, meaning the ones that are already on, you, on your computer, in your computer. So in that case, um, you will have to click them and it will take you to the folder in your computer. But we're suggesting using most, uh, usually using cloud recordings. So what can we do once we have that recording? Let's say I want to do something with this one, assignments, grade book, and speed grader. You will click that and it will take you to this window. And here uh, you can see the different files that were created in the recording. So for example, we have the audio file, we have the audio transcript, we have the chat file, and of course we have the video. So you could even download this if you click here, download, but uh, probably you want to share this. So if you want to share this, you will click on this share button and this window will appear and here you will have the shareable link and, um, and a passcode because every time you get this shareable link and someone wants to access it, they will need the passcode. So it will look something like this. Let's see, let me open it here. Let's say somebody, oh, um, one second. Okay, so it was this one, and let's say I want to share it. I go to share, copy this link, send it to someone. Oh, for some reason, it's not showing up. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know why it's not showing up, but what the people, what the person would see would be just like a window asking them to put the passcode. So always make sure that when you send them the link, also send them the password, which is here. And you can just copy that. And then if for some reason you want to edit the video, let's say you want to um, trim it in the end or in, at the beginning, 
you can do that uh, quite easily here on, in Zoom. So it's just a matter of clicking on the thumbnail. It will take you to the video. And then here in the video, you'll see like the entirety of the video, also the chat and all of that. And if you want to edit that, because maybe, I don't know, like at the end, you forgot to stop the recording and maybe you were talking to a colleague. So the video includes that and you obviously don't want people to see that. The way you can do it is just going here to this um, window and just clicking on this icon here, this trim icon. So this will allow you to trim the video to select where it, where it finishes and where it begins in case you want to trim it at the beginning as well. And once that's done, you just click on trim. Just take note that um, while the program is um, trimming the video, like doing that processing, you won't be able to share it. I mean, you can share it, but people won't be able to see it yet. So maybe first do the trimming and then share the link. And yep, that's it for the uh, best practices. Um, so now that we've sort of gone through um, every all of the uh, sort of best practices and um, you know nitty gritty of facilitating on Zoom, uh, we'd just like to give everyone the opportunity to ask some questions that you may have. Um, about, let me just make sure that I'm sharing my screen and it's working, best practices, is that working? Yep. Okay, so if there are any questions or um, uh, ideas or things that maybe you're less sure about with Zoom, now is your chance to ask. And this could be something small, like a small setting, or it could be something complicated. Um, or a scenario and any sort of advice that you might like on how to set things up. Yeah, or, or maybe something that we didn't cover and that you have encountered before using Zoom and you'd like to understand how that works or, or what can be done. No questions? No. Yeah. Okay. Oh, do uh, was this like new stuff? Some some of the things that we covered. Chat. Thank you, Katie. Okay. Thanks, Dave. That's good. Thanks, Tasnim. Thank you. So yes, our next session um, will be. Uh, in a couple of weeks time and again we'll be looking at um, some more specific uh, issues with zoom um, especially pertaining to recording configurations and um, other other you know small nitty-gritty things that we maybe didn't cover in today's session um, but what i would recommend if you are planning to come to the second session is have a play around with zoom maybe try some of the things that we mentioned today um, and for our next session, um, you know, bring any questions that you may have as well. Yeah, I think it could be interesting, like I mentioned at the beginning, like in the settings, we have so many options. So if you take a look at those in, in these days, then you can ask us some questions related to those ones that we didn't cover. So that could be something interesting to check out. Definitely. Okay, well, thank you everyone for coming. And uh, we'll be hanging around until the end of the hour. So if you have any specific questions that you would prefer to ask uh, privately, that's absolutely fine. Um, but otherwise, um, thank you for sharing your lunch hour with us thank and uh, take care. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Uh, Junko, did you have any questions? Okay, I think we might finish up then.
Yeah. All right. I'll talk to you guys soon. See you soon. Bye. Thank yeah. you. Bye. Thanks. Bye. 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 -bye.